Then it's Friday here. Looking out my window, I can see the old fella across the street on the corner, down on his knees, pulling weeds out of his yard. That's not going to happen in our yard. Uh, I'm not about to get down on my knees and pull out weeds. So, But anyway, uh, as I was reading yesterday about the deplorable word, <clears throat> and... Uh, Polly and Diggory were trying to, to escape uh, this uh, great queen, but she had grabbed hold of her hair, and uh, they uh, got their rings in their pockets, and they were rushing upward, and a warm green light was growing near overhead. And today is the beginning of Uncle Andrew's troubles. Let go, let go, screamed Polly. I'm not touching you, said Diggory. Then their heads came out of the pool, and once more, the sunny quietness of the wood between the worlds was all about them, and it seemed richer and warmer and more peaceful than ever after the staleness and ruin of the place they had just left. I think that if they had been given the chance, they would have again forgotten who they were and where they came from and would have lain down and enjoyed themselves half asleep, listening to the growing of the trees. But this time there was something that kept them as wide awake as possible, for as soon as they got out onto the grass, they found that they were not alone. The queen, or the witch, whichever you'd like to call her, had come up with them, holding on fast by Polly's hair, and that's why Polly had been shouting out, loud let's go this <clears throat> proved by the way another thing about the rings which uncle andrew hadn't told diggory because he didn't know it himself in order to jump from one world to another by using one of those rings you don't need to be wearing or touching it yourself it is enough if you go if you're touching someone who is touching it and in that way they work like a magnet and every one knows that if you pick up a pen with a magnet, any other pen which is touching the first pen will come too. Now that you saw her in the wood, Queen Jadis looked different. She was much paler than she had been, so pale that hardly any of her beauty was left. And she was stooped and seemed to be finding it hard to breathe, as if the air of that place stifled her. Neither of the children felt in the least afraid of her now. Let go, let go of my hair, said Polly. What do you mean by it? Here, let go of her hair at once, said Diggory. They both turned and struggled with her. They were stronger than she, and in a few seconds they had forced her to let go. She reeled back, panting, and there was a look of terror in her eyes. Quick, Diggory, said Polly, change rings and into the home pool. Help, help, mercy, said the witch in a faint voice, staggering after them. Take me with you. You cannot mean to leave me in this horrible place. It's killing me. It's a reason of state, said Polly spitefully. Well, <clears throat> like when you lift killed all those people in your own world. Do be quick, Diggory. They put on their green rig rings, but Diggory said, oh, bother. What are we to do? He couldn't help feeling a little sorry for the queen. Oh, don't be such an ass, said Polly. Ten to one, she's only shamming. Do come on. And then both children plunged into the home pool. It's a good thing we made that mark, thought Polly. But as they jumped, Diggory felt that a large cold finger and thumb had caught him by the ear. And as they sank down and the confused shapes of our own world began to appear, the grip of that finger and thumb grew stronger. The witch was apparently recovering her strength. Diggory struggled and kicked but it was not of the least use. In a moment, they found themselves in Uncle Andrew's study, and there was Uncle Andrew himself, staring at the wonderful creature that Diggory had brought back from beyond the world. And well, he might stare. Diggory and Polly stared too. 
There was no doubt that the witch had got over her faint <clears throat> faintingness, and now she was the one. <clears throat> and now that one saw her in our own world, with ordinary things around her, she fairly took one's breath away. In Charn, she had been alarming enough. In London, she was terrifying. For one thing, they had not re realized till now was how very big she was. Hardly human was what Diggory thought when he looked at her. And he may have been right, for some say there is a giantish blood in the royal family of Charn. But even her height was nothing compared with her beauty, her fierceness, and her wildness. She looked ten times more alive than most of the people who meet one meets in London. Uncle Andrew was bowing and rubbing his hands and looking, to tell the truth, extremely frightened. He seemed a little shrimp of a creature beside the witch. And yet, as Polly said afterwards, there was a sort of likeness between her face and his, something in the expression. It was the look that all wicked magicians have, the mark which Jadis had said she could not find in Diggory's face. One good thing about seeing the two together was that you would never again be afraid of Uncle Andrew, any more than you'd be afraid of a worm after you had met a rattlesnake or afraid of a cow after you had met a mad bull. Pooh, thought Diggory to himself. Him a magician, not much. But she now, she's the real thing. Uncle Andrew kept on rubbing his hands and bowing. He was trying to say something very polite, but his mouth had gone dry so that he could not speak. His experiment with the rings, as he called it, was turning out more successful than he liked. For though he had dabbled in magic for years, he had always left all the dangers, as far as one can, to other people. Nothing at all like this had ever happened to him before. Then Jadis spoke, not very loud, but there was something in her voice that made the whole room quiver. Where is the magician who has called me into this world? Ah, uh, madam, <clears throat> gasped Andrew, ah, most honored, highly gratified, a most unexpected pleasure. If only I had the opportunity of making my preparations, I, I... Where is the magician, fool? said Jadis. Uh, I am, madam. I hope you will excuse it, or in liberty these naughty children may have taken. I assure you there was no intention. You, said the queen in a still small, terrible voice, a still more terrible voice. Then in one stride, she crossed the room and seized a great handful of Uncle Andrew's gray hair and pulled his head back so his face looked up into hers. Then she studied his face just as she had studied Diggory's face in the Palace of Charn. He blinked and lipped his lips nervously all the time. At last she let him go, suddenly that he reeled back against the wall. I see, she said scornfully. You are a magician of a sort. Stand up, dog, and don't sprawl out there as if you were speaking to your equals. How do you come to know magic? You are not of royal blood, I'll swear. Well, uh, not perhaps in a strict sense, stammered Uncle Andrew. Not exactly royal, ma'am. The Ketterleys are, however, a very old family and old Dorsetshire family, ma'am. Peace, said the witch. I see what you are. You're a little peddling magician who works by rules and books. There is no real magic in your blood and heart. Your kind was made to end of <clears throat> was made at the, an end of it in my world a thousand years ago. But here I shall allow you to be my servant. I should be most happy. Delighted to be of any service, uh, a pleasure, I soon assure you. Peace, you talk too much. Listen to your first task. I see we are in a large city. Procure for me at once a chariot or a flying carpet or a well-trained dragon or whatever is usual for royal and noble persons in your land. 
Then bring me to the place where I can get clothes and jewels and slaves fit for my rank. Tomorrow I will begin the conquest of the world. I, I, I go and order a cab at once, gasped Uncle Andrew. <clears throat> Stop, said the witch, just as he reached the door. Do not dream of treachery. My eyes can see through walls and into the minds of men. They will be on you everywhere you go. At the first sign of disobedience, I will launch such spells on you that anything you sit down on will feel like red-hot iron, and whenever you lie in a bed, there will be an invisible blocks of ice at your feet. Now go! The old man went out looking like a dog with its tail between its legs. The children were now afraid with J that Jadis would have something to say to them about what had happened in the wood. As it turned out, however, she never mentioned it either then or afterwards. I think, and Diggory thinks too, that her mind was of a sort which cannot remember that quiet place at all. However often you took her there and however long you left her there, she would still know nothing about it. Now that she, had, she was left alone with the children, she took no notice of either of them, and that was like her too. In charm, she had taken no notice of Polly till the very end, because Diggory was the one she wanted to make use of. Now that she had Uncle Andrew, she took no notice of Diggory. I expect most witches are like that. They are not interested in things or people unless they can use them, and they are terribly practical. So there was silence in the room for a minute or two. But you could tell by the way Jadis tapped her foot her foot on the floor, that she was growing impatient. Presently she said as if to herself, What is this old fool dueling, doing? I should have brought a whip. She stalked out of the room in pursuit of Uncle Andrew without a, one glance at the children. Phew, said Polly, letting out a long breath of relief. And now I must get home. I'm frightfully late and I'll, I'll catch it. Well, do, do come back as soon as you can, said Diggory. This is simply ghastly having her here. We must make some sort of plan. That's up to your Uncle Andrew now, said Polly. It was he who started all this messing about with magic. All the same, you will come back, won't you? Hang it all, you can't leave me alone in a scrape like this. I shall go home by the tunnel, said Polly rather coldly. That'll be the quickest way. And if you want me to come back, hadn't you better say you're sorry? Sorry, exclaimed Diggory. <clears throat> well, now, if that isn't just like a girl, what have I done? Oh, nothing, of course, said Polly sarcastically. Only nearly screwed my wrist off in that room with all the waxworks, with a cowardly bully, like a cowardly bully. Only struck the bell with a hammer, like a silly idiot only turned back in the woods so that you had she had time to catch hold of you before we jumped into her own pool. That's all. Oh, said Diggory, very surprised. Well, all right. I'll say I'm sorry. And I really am sorry about what happened in the waxwork rooms. There I said I'm sorry. And now do be decent and, and come back. I shall be a frightful hole if you don't. I shall be in a frightful hole if you don't. I don't see what's going to happen to you. It's Mr. Ketterly who's got to sit on red-hot chairs and have ice in his bed, isn't it? It isn't that sort of thing, said Diggory. What I'm bothered about is mother. Suppose that creature went into her room. She might frighten her to death. Oh, I see, said Polly in a rather different voice. All right, we'll call it Pax. I'll come back if I can, but I must go now. And she crawled through the little door into the tunnel, in that dark place among the rafters which seemed so exciting and adventurous a few hours ago seemed quite tame and homey now. We must go back to we must go back to Uncle Andrew. His poor old heart went pit a pat as he staggered down the attic stairs, and he kept on dabbing his forehead with his handkerchief. When he reached his bedroom, which was on the floor below, he locked himself in, and the very first thing he did was to grope in his wardrobe for a bottle and a wine glass, which he always kept hidden 
there where Uncle Aunt, uh, Aunt Letty could not find him. He poured himself out a glass full of some nasty grown-up drink and drank it off in one gulp. Then he drew a deep breath. Upon my word, he said to himself, I'm dreadfully shaken, most upsetting, and at my time of life. He poured out a second glass and drank it too. Then he began to change his clothes. You have never seen such clothes, but I can just remember them. He put on a very high, shiny, stiff collar of the sort that you hold your chin up all the time. He put on a white waistcoat with a pattern on it and, it, and arranged it as gold watch chain across the front. He put on his best frock coat, the one he kept for weddings and funerals. He got out his best tall hat and polished it up. There was a vase of flowers, put there by Aunt Letty, on his dressing table. He took one and put it in his buttonhole. He took a clean handkerchief, a lovely one such as you couldn't buy today, out of the little left-hand drawer and put a few drops of scent on it. He took his eyeglass with a thick black ribbon and screwed it into his eye. Then he looked at himself in a mirror. Children have one kind of silliness, as you know, and grown-ups have another kind. At this moment, Uncle Andrew was beginning to be silly in a very grown-up way. Now that the witch was no longer in the same room with him, he was quickly forgetting how she had frightened him and thinking more and more of her wonderful beauty. He kept on saying to himself, a dim fine woman, sir, a dim fine woman, a superb creature. He had also somehow managed to forget that it was the children who had got hold of his superb creature. He felt as if he himself, by his magic, had called her out of the unknown worlds. Andrew, my boy, he said to himself as he looked in the glass, you're a devilish well-preserved fellow for your age, a distinguishing-looking man, sir. You see, the foolish old man was actually beginning to imagine the wick witch would fall in love with him. The two drinks probably had something to do with it, and so had his best clothes. But he was, in any case, as vain as a peacock, and that was why he had become a magician. He unlocked the door, went downstairs, sent the housemaid out to fetch a hansom. Everyone had lots of servants in those days, and looked into the drawing room. There, as he expected, he found Aunt Letty. She was busily mending a mattress. It lay on the floor near the window, and she was kneeling on it. Ah, Latina, my dear, said Uncle Andrew. I uh, have to go out. Just lend me five pounds or so. There's a good gal. Good gal. Gal was a way to pronounce girl. No, Andrew, dear, said Aunt Letty in her firm, quiet voice without looking up from her work. I've told you times without number that I will not lend you money. Now, pray, don't be troublesome, dear Gil, said Uncle Andrew. It's most important. You will put me in a dreadfully awkward position if you don't. Andrew, said Uncle Letty, looking him straight in the face. I wonder you are not ashamed to ask me for money. There was a long, dull story of a grown-up kind behind these words. All you need to know about it is that Uncle Andrew, what between managing dear Letty's business matters for her, and never doing any work and running up large bills for brandy and cigars, which Aunt Letty had paid again and again, had made her a good deal poorer than she had been thirty years ago. My dear gal, said Uncle Andrew, you don't understand. I, ha I shall have some quite unexpected expenses today. I have to do a little entertaining. Come now, don't be tiresome. And who, pray, are you going to entertain, Andrew? Asked Aunt Letty. Uh, a most distinguished visitor has just arrived. Distinguished fiddlesticks, said Aunt Letty. There hasn't been a ring at the bell for the last hour. At that moment, the door was suddenly flung open, Aunt Letty looked, turned, looked around and saw with amazement that an enormous woman, splendidly dressed, with bare arms and flashing eyes, stood in the or doorway. It was the witch. 
And that's the story for today. Tomorrow is going to be what happened at the front door. So you all have a wonderful day and praying for you and that uh, things would go well at your homes. Sure do love you all. Bye-bye. Talk to you later.